On this episode of the Contagious Influencers of America podcast, we're talking about babies. Babies on ice. What happens to extra embryos after IVF treatment? This controversial topic is the premise of a new romance movie, of all things. It comes from our good friend, New York Times bestselling author, Karen Kingsbury. Other people had done movies based on my books, and they I was always thankful. Great ideas and, and great projects, but it was never quite what was in my heart. Welcome to CIA Contagious Influencers of America, the podcast from the producers of Keep the Faith. It's good to be with you. I'm David Sands. Today, we have New York Times bestselling novelist Karen Kingsbury right here in the house with us, the, the uh, Homestead Studio, and she's bringing along her son, film director Tyler Russell. And boy, do they have something really, really cool to talk about because they have teamed up to bring us a film that... Uh, well, it's quite unique, and it's a real experience. It's called Someone Like You, and of course, uh, Karen had a, a book by that title, but uh, this is going to be really a, a, an amazing film. It comes out April the 2nd, and uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a movie that the timing just could not be uh, better because it, it, it centers around uh, IVF, IVF treatment, uh, uh, twin sisters, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 an IVF sort of adoption. There are just so many things that you just don't expect in this movie, and it's so timely, and I can't wait for you to see it. I, I've watched it uh, a couple of times. And I watched it with my wife, and we both we both just loved it. So uh, I can't wait for you to see it. It comes out on April the second. They're going to talk about uh, their new company and what it was like working together. Uh, they've uh, they've hung a new shingle, Karen Kingsbury Productions. Of course, she's done movies and TV shows in the past, but this time she decided to step up to the plate and take a swing at movie making uh, with uh, with her son. And I want to tell you something. Um, uh, this is just a beautiful film. And I know you're going to really enjoy it very much. So uh, uh, I'll have them here in just a second. But first, coming to theaters this spring from number one New York Times bestselling author Karen Kingsbury, Someone Like You. It's a beautiful morning. I fell in love with London Quinn in high school. London. When everything is lost. I'm so sorry. Love will lead you home. You can't bring her back, man. Do I look like London? She always wanted me to find someone like you. Thank God I do. Someone Like You. This film is not yet rated in theaters April 2nd. Go to someonelikeyou.movie. Well, welcome back, you two. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thanks. We're happy to be here. This is awesome. So what's been happening since uh, we last met? Wow. Well, uh, we made a movie, and uh, it was it was quite a feat. Yeah, we, um, you know, we just decided it had been time enough that other people had done movies based on my books, and they I was always thankful, great ideas and, and great projects, but it was never quite what was in my heart. So my husband and I, we had this like incredible conversation, and Donald put his hands on my shoulders and he said, "Look, if we have to sell everything we have." We have to make our own movie. And so, uh, you know, and obviously he's not with us today, but he was that reason who he was one that helped me to be able to say, I, it was, you know, terrifying. We were using our family savings, um, but I was confident at that point to go ahead and jump. So uh, you've got everything riding on this, huh? Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> but what a great leap of faith. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. It was. You know, it started with, with a script. So in uh, May of 22, I wrote a script about my book, Someone Like You, turned it into a movie script. And the next conversation was with Tyler here, who is an incredibly talented filmmaker and director. Now, he hadn't done a feature film, a theatrical feature, um, but I knew he was ready. So I asked him to pray about it. And and I did. I prayed about it. And I, I love the story. I read the book when it came out, obviously, because I try to read every book as soon as they come out. Mm -hmm. And um, loved the story, sat with it for a little bit, prayed about it, and just thought, what a what an amazing opportunity to get to have my first film as a director be with 
someone like you, you know, with, with my mom, <laughs> with an amazing writer, amazing creative person. And, um, and then we started collaborating on the script after I said, yeah, let's do it. Let's make it happen. And yeah, I think, I feel like it was maybe just, you know, a month or two later we had a script and now we had hired a casting director and we were off to the races, like opened our production office in our own house, which was probably not something we would do again, but it was fun to have people. We, we had a little devotion each day and we said right up front, this is God's movie. This is not something that, you know, we're taking ownership for really. We're inviting God to be part of the process mm -hmm. and to really own the movie. And, you know, I don't know where people necessarily were in their faith, but they all, participated they'd gather in the morning at the house at the, which was now the office and we'd do a little devotion and then they would get to work and it was just like one answered prayer after another i didn't I feel like that absolutely yeah and i think it's with a huge dream like that or a big project or a big opportunity you have to partner with god for him to fill in the gaps and the places that we lack and we we learned so much we had a great team but we also knew that with the lord leading us um we, we couldn't fail, you know, because he was going to take us where we needed to be. Yeah. So so what was it like uh, working together? Well, you know, we've we've worked together writing books and we've worked together writing scripts. We had A Thousand Tomorrows that whole season on Pure Flix, So we've done that. And usually with writing, we kind of work in different places and then come together to see the, the kind of end product and work on that mm -hmm. and then edit it and maybe make notes. And then we separate, go back to our own own places but with the movie it was every day all day um, in person you know working together Tyler was he's a co-producer and he really was a part of every aspect like the script but then it was locations and we had a locations manager but he was the one you know taking a trip going out seeing if that lake spot worked or if that dock could hold a camera that kind of thing um, and so when we actually started shooting which was in October mm -hmm. right of 22 mm -hmm. Then it truly was 12 hour days every day, all day. And Tyler was uh, in his glory. I mean, he was just working hard and I kind of slipped into the backgrounds and the shadows. And I wore, you know, a set of headphones and stayed in Video Village and just watched it all come to life, really. Well, I mean, I think what's great about working together is obviously we know each other well. We know when someone might be unhappy with something or needs an adjustment here or there. And we have a good shorthand, not only creatively, but just... Um, in, in work as well. So I knew that if I, you know, if we finished a scene with actors, I'd rush over and just go, was that good, you know, or anything. And she usually was just, we had had so many conversations before about the script or the ways that, that scene should go. So I just knew if I ran in and I got the thumbs up, we were good to, to move on, you know, but really she was, she was so trusting and um, I'm really grateful that she trusted the process and trusted our crew. We had an amazing crew. Yep. They were all Nashville, Tennessee crew. And um, it just was a really cool opportunity to trust each other as as creative collaborators, you know, but also as family and also as, as uh, co-workers in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it I think because we had a relationship and we knew an argument's not going to result in one of us storming off set you know or like getting in an <laughs> argument or we knew that we were in unity and we were serving the people we were working with and serving the lord and so how can we make the best scene today you know focusing on one shot at a time yeah so so who got the final cut um the director <laughs> or the new york times best-selling author <laughs> you know honestly it was i think it was so collaborative right yeah it really was i mean he was it was him i had nothing to say over him directing like he didn't need my help with that um but there might be things like he took it was a huge job he's young you know it's his first time to do a feature he's done other movies but not features hmm. and so i had certain standards that and tyler agreed with the standards but then he had to be the one to make them happen mm -hmm. so no inappropriate clothing and, and we had gone over all things with wardrobe but if somebody's you know there was something that wasn't quite right i would say got to pull that shirt up or pull it down or what and and that would be my kind of note is i'm looking mm -hmm. out for my readers i'm looking out for the integrity of my reputation and of the lord's mm -hmm. and he was as well but sometimes that was you know where we needed to be just like okay you know let's make sure that this isn't said or that mm -hmm. isn't said and it was golden i mean our actors were phenomenal They're amazing yeah and i think 
working with our editor, who also was our DP. He was there every day on set, and we know him really well. Yeah. So He's a believer as well. Yeah, and I knew every time I would show her something, like if it was a completed sequence or once we were kind of in post-production, I knew she was going to love it because I just knew what she wanted. <laughs> and I, I know her heart for story. I know her heart for the readers and for the people that were making this movie for. So it was easy to know this doesn't feel right because I know she wouldn't be happy with this or she wouldn't want it to look that way or feel that way. So it almost felt like I was an extension of, you know, <laughs> what what she wanted. I could be her eyes and ears in a room that she might not be in. Um, there really wasn't another director on the planet who would have understood that. So I didn't want God's name in vain. You know, obviously I didn't want any language. I didn't, and you know, actors will take a script, but they'll kind of make it their own. And that's fine. As long as we're sticking with the story and we're not crossing these lines that I, as unto the Lord, was not going to cross. And, and he understood that. He mm-hmm. felt the same way. Mm-hmm. So, you know, having someone who doesn't get the discernment of what the Holy Spirit is doing on set, lifetime, while this movie is being made, that would never have worked. I mean, Tyler was perfect for that. So um, you've done many uh, projects, many movies, uh, 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 TV. Um, so and so, th- but this is a theatrical. What makes this different? Well, for one thing, it's our. It was our company making it. So there was a there was a theatrical many years ago on like Dandelion Dust. It just had a limited theatrical run. The difference here was honestly, you know, money makes the decision when it comes to a movie. So even if we would have said, okay, we'll open Karen Kingsbury Productions, which we did in the, you know May of 22, and then we'll make a movie, but now how do we get money? Then the people who invest in a movie, they're the ones who will make decisions. So if I said, look, I want to work with Fathom, I want this to be a movie that you know can go to theaters and I don't have a lot of bureaucracy, but we can just get, like, get it in front of as many people as we can. And, and that is what I wanted. Um, but if I had investors, they might say, no, 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 we're going to hold out for a deal with Universal or Sony. So it's in order to have this particular movie, and I, I love everything about it, like you are absolutely going to love it, um, you had to pay for it. And so that is the difference. The difference is we paid for it. So every single second, every sound, every line, every filter, Every decision about way which way that particular scene was going to go, mm-hmm. we got to make that. So, uh, where did you uh, tell me about um, uh, the uh, the actors and and uh, how how you uh, chose them and uh, why they're uh, perfect for these roles? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had an amazing casting director, Ricky Maslar, who um, we worked with her on A Thousand Tomorrows with Pure Flix. So we just said, hey, let's do another one. And she's very connected. She kind of. She loved the story. She knew what she was looking for. And she, she reached out to agencies and actors that she knew. And I think we had, I don't know, maybe... Thousands. Yeah, we thousands. had thousands of submissions. I for think for the, role. Yeah, and for, for the main female lead, um, we needed an actress who could play both sisters, who was able to, you know, have lots of emotion, lots of depth, and the capacity to be able to, to carry a lot of this film. And I think we saw over... 2000 tapes it feels like you know we just spent Mm -hmm. days like watching these auditions of wonderful actresses people who are so talented um we called back i think four of them Mm -hmm. um and we had a zoom call back and and read lines with them on zoom and talked with them and then eventually we found sarah fisher who's a great actress um, originally from canada she lives in california now and um so she was somebody who immediately was like she has all of the the traits, you know, and and obviously having written the script together, it was easy to know what kind of characteristics we needed. And then we know and and had found Jake Allen. Yeah, our lead, our male lead, we knew him, and he's actually in the Baxter's TV show, which will be debuting uh, March 28th. That's not been announced just yet, but I am by now, I'm sure people will know that. And he's in that. So we had seen him work on set and knew how talented he was. So one of my first calls was to Jake to say, Hey, are you available October, November? Can you, would you be interested in a lead part? And he was so excited. So we had him going in, but then Sarah was quite a a challenge to find her. And she was, it was uncanny Mm. how she could play the role of London and literally be one person. Mm -hmm. And then later, and sometimes on the same day, because we only get your, you know, you get your locations only happen, you know, you get one set of two days at this coffee shop. And so she had to be London for some of those scenes, and then Andy for some others. And she would be a totally different person. She'd mm-hmm. stand a little straighter. Uh, her voice was a little different. Her laugh was different. It was amazing. Yeah. And then, you know, Lynn Collins, Scott Reeves, 
Bart and Robin, Li- um, Robin Lively and Bart Johnson. Um, just as the parents. Yeah, as yeah. the parents, you know, they all just, they all were so talented. Mm. But one thing that we needed, as this being our first film, you know, as a production company yeah. and, and my first feature as a director, we needed actors who, who loved the story and who knew that, all right, this is a smaller film. This is maybe, you know, Bart has done stuff with Disney and Robin's done stuff with Netflix. You know, we have actors who've worked on Marvel and, but they all fell in love with the script and they fell in love with ultimately, you know, her heart. And, um, and I think I was able to say, you know, we're not Marvel, we're not Disney, but this is going to be impactful. And this is a story that you'll want to be a part of. And once everybody was on board, you know, we had amazing collaboration, super generous performances, just beautiful. It was a really great time. And um, I'm so glad we found the people that we did. Yeah, and one of the things too, as a you know, he, as a first time theatrical director, a lot of times actors might say, "No, I'm not going to work with a first time director because you know they don't get a mirror. The director is their mirror, so it's hard for them. They've got this is going to live on, and if the director doesn't make them look good or give them enough mm-hmm. feedback." input to be able to do the best performance they could, then they would have nothing. So trusting Mm. Tyler was a big piece of it. But once they had conversations with him, they were all in. And I'll brag a little bit, you know, I can do that as a mom. Uh, After the movie was over, when we wrapped it, when we wrapped filming, those, all of those, and then we have them on film in their EPK interviews. They all said the same thing. You know, we've worked in movies for 20 years, some of them, 30 years. And uh, Tyler is like our favorite director. He's such an actor's director. He pulled things out of us we didn't know we were capable of giving. Mm. Uh, so it was just beautiful. Like, they were so talented, and we were beyond blessed mm-hmm. to have each of the the role of you know the biological parents and then the parents who adopted the embryo. In this case, um, all four of these actors were so talented. But the fact that they stepped into that and trusted Tyler mm-hmm. and allowed Tyler to lean in toward their performances. Um, that that's why we have what we have. I mean, every studio executive that's had a chance to see someone like you says it looks like a thirty million dollar movie, and the acting is just phenomenal. So that's good. So what makes a, what makes a good story, and what makes a good story worthy of the big screen? Yeah, and that's a really important question because you know, as I'm looking over my books, I've written hmm. you know seventy plus novels, and now I'm looking at them, saying, which one are we going to invest all of our savings in to make the first theatrical for Karen Kingsbury Productions? And I was looking at a couple different things. Uh, one, cinematography. So I needed there to be moments where you would just be oh, blown away by the vision of what you're seeing. And someone like you has jet ski scenes. It has a beautiful glass house perched on the edge of a cliff overlooking the water where this young architect lives. And uh, the idea that there were hiking scenes in the zoo. So these are cinematic moments that belong on a big screen. So that, I needed a story that had that, not just, you can't just be in a building or in a classroom, you know, you had to have moments Mm -hmm. that took your breath away. Um, Then, and then the next thing to me is something that's sort of a high concept. So we can watch, you know, love stories all day long on, Hallmark or different channels, and those all serve their own kind of purpose. This had to be set apart, something so different. And of course, there's there's tragedy in this particular story that um, people will resonate with, but that doesn't normally, you don't normally see that in a Hallmark movie um, or, or one on a streaming channel. But also the idea of an embryo adoption. Like mm. n- most people don't even know that exists, that you could, you know, do your, have your in vitro fertilization use however many embryos and these are little babies or four cells you know there it's not eggs and it's 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 a baby and then you would have leftovers and what do you do with them mm. and the people who have a, a you know a conscious issue with that morale you know morally they will put them in deep freeze and wait to see if maybe they might need more later but oftentimes they don't so then they you know in that case they have to decide what to do with them and some people just you know down a sink and other people say, no, 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 I mean, these are little souls on ice, mm. and let's donate them to an embryo adoption center. And they're all over the country. In fact, there are about 500,000 embryos on ice right now awaiting adoption, and some for decades, and they're perfectly healthy, mm. ready to be implanted at any point. So that element of the story, two twin sisters separated as embryos, um, I mean, there's never been a story like that. So you have to have something no one's ever seen before for it to make it to the big screen. 
I wonder if there are any of these from like the 1940s. <laughs> you know what's funny? We had a screening. We had a screening of our movie, and someone came up to me, and she worked at a daycare. So these kids are like you know four or five years old, and she said that they these twins were embryos conceived in the 70s. And so here they're we all are. like 50. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Isn't that I so mean, interesting? It's, it's like, it's I, a fascinating thing to think about. It is. I often say, you know, right now, science is raising questions that only God can answer. Mm-hmm. Because you could, you know, have this embryo that's out there and you could feasibly meet somebody and they're your sibling. Mm. Especially, you know, and this is where honesty comes in because one of the conflicts in the story is that the parents who took the embryo, so they're the, in, in theory, they're, they're the adopted parents parents in this case but they never told her and i and i think that would be easy to miss for a family that if you get an you know an embryo implanted and this baby Mm -hmm. takes and now you might tell yourself maybe maybe it was us maybe it wasn't the embryo Mm -hmm. you know how unless you do a dna test you aren't even sure about that and then you have this baby who you you know the mom went Mm -hmm. through the entire pregnancy prayed over this little baby growing inside of her and had this moment, you know, with the ultrasound pictures and then delivered the baby. Mm -hmm. Of course, that doesn't feel like someone else's child. But then if you're 24 and you find out, oh, hey, you were never biologically related to your parents, that can rock your world. Yeah. And I think that that's an element of what makes a great story is like these conversations that I know people will have when they see the movie. You know, what would you do if you found out you were adopted as an embryo or how do you feel about in vitro, you know, or these babies on ice. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's fascinating discussions that sometimes you don't always have a, a clear cut answer to, but isn't that why we watch and read great stories to, to think about these concepts that are super interesting, you know? Brings a, uh, it's a new way of defining old soul. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, it that's is. True. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, yeah. I had no idea. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, when, it, when did they start this? Well, I, when I was a reporter, so uh, I was a reporter for the LA Times back in the like mid to late 80s, and I was doing the front page um, kind of feature story for Sunday edition at that point. I had started off in sports, but then now I was doing features, and they sent me to a clinic where, an in vitro clinic, where they were holding, you, I got to look at these you know kind of deep freeze tubes. It's cryopreservation. They actually put the little embryos in there, and the, the story at that point was this was kind of new technology, but mm. sometimes a husband and wife might get divorced. So who gets the embryo? Like, is the woman still allowed to go forward and have the embryo and bring the baby to full term? And then does the guy then owe child support? So the question was more of a legal one relationally as to, in fact, the headline on that story was whose souls on ice? Whose souls? Who do they belong to? So the technology has been around for you know a while, um, but the kind of intricacies of the moral dilemma that come up as a result, that's new. Mm, wow. So uh, what, what, what are your, what, what do you, other than to get your money back so you don't lose the farm, <laughs> um, what, <laughs> what, what do you hope to accomplish with this film? Well, you know, it's funny, uh, one of the executives in one of our partners and, you know, who, who are helping with the release of the film watched it and said, this movie is exactly what we need. This movie is next generation Christian film. And that's not to negate what's gone before or what might yet still be coming out because there's a lot of different ways to reach people with story on screen. Um, and it could involve a sermon from a church and that could be a scene. And those movies are beautiful. And this is just, this is different in the way that it's more parable than it is um, a preaching kind of a story. So without a doubt, I mean, I'm an evangelist. You know, at the end of the day, I'm an evangelist who writes books, and I'm an evangelist now that makes movies. And my my prayer for this film is that it will change culture, that people will come and they'll hear lines like, uh, you know, the world is divided enough. You don't want your family divided too. And when they get to that, I mean, I, people are going to be weeping in the theaters. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a love story, yes. But it's about a lot of different kinds of love. And family love is a big part of that because especially since the pandemic, there has been much division in families, in friendships, in relationships. And we're looking to see God heal people and to bring them into a closer relationship with each other and with him because of the film. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think 
I think as a filmmaker, as a film person, I want people to enjoy it. Yes, of course. You know, to have a great night out, whether it's a date night or ladies' night out or family. You know, the great thing about this movie is, you know, while there is some serious drama and heaviness, you can bring your whole family. And it's a movie that... Um, and there's a lot of joy. A lot of joy, A yeah. lot of love and joy in it, too. I think we made a great love story that you can watch time and time again and find new things and fall in love with it all over again and, and love the characters. But I, I resonate with what she was saying because I think it shows how when things fall apart, how can we pick up the pieces and decide to move forward, even though it might look different, you know, even though the pottery is smashed, can we assemble it in a way where this is a different version of myself, but I, I know that there's hope and I know that we're going to be okay. And we're, and we're going to find a way to a new life with the new information we have and with this choice to say, all right, I know that people always say, you know, beauty comes from ashes, but you don't know until you're walking through it just how hard that can be. So I hope it creates conversation and that people leave feeling hopeful that if their situation is broken, they don't have to get over it or forget that it happened. Um, It doesn't just go away, but they can start to pick up the pieces and say, how can I be okay today? Yeah, that's one of my favorite parts at the end of the movie. Larry and Louise are the biological parents. So the in vitro fertilization process was theirs. And Mm. they implanted one, and that was London. But then she had problems with her pregnancy and couldn't implant the other. And that other embryo was the one that was donated Mm. and given away. And they lost track of it. They weren't supposed to know what happened to it. But they have a tragic situation happen early in the film, and we lose London. And these parents are grieving, and then they get to meet this daughter that they never even really knew existed. What a moment that would be, and yet to love her enough to love her to go back home. And Mm. she doesn't belong with them. She belongs back home. That's like an ultimate picture of a mother's love. And at the end of the movie, there's a moment with Larry and Louise on the front porch, and they're still devastated. There's no question that you're still going to walk around like you're missing your arm for the rest of your life Mm -hmm. after a loss like that. But she's sitting on the porch, she's got her Bible, mm. and uh, he walks out and, you know, how you doing? And, and she says, you know, I'm out here, I was out here talking to God just now, and he reminded me of so many things that I have to be thankful for. And then she just kind of looks deep into his eyes and she says, we're going to be okay. We mm-hmm. are. And wow, that is a message I want people to take from this. Like everyone's going through something. But if you can just lift your eyes, lift Mm -hmm. your eyes to something greater than yourself, you're going to be okay. So Tyler, um, now, now for the good questions. Um, (laughs) when, when, um, when did you, uh, realize that, um, your mom was, uh, uniquely, <laughs> oh man! Yeah. Let's just say, let's just say different. Sure, different. I am different. Yeah, it's true. Sure, There's mm-hmm. no question. I think right away, and I wanted to be just as different. You know, I think, uh, like what age? Oh gosh, ten, maybe younger. Five? Yeah, maybe, maybe younger. younger. I mean, yeah, like these books would come to the house, boxes of books with her face on them, and now did she make you, all the kids read all the books? No, yeah, it was mandatory. <laughs> In order to get Christmas gifts. No book yeah. before time. No. Right. No, but I actually, I mean, I have, I read slower than she writes, so I haven't quite caught up on everything <laughs> she's read, but I will say out of all my siblings, I've read the most. Yeah. And I love them. And I, I started reading them really young, probably around 10 or 11. And, um, and I, but I, I remember watching her create a lot. And then, you know, these books would come to the house or she would go speak at a, a you know, a woman's conference or an event somewhere. And sometimes she'd take me with her and I'd sit there in the front row and she'd give a talk and make people cry and laugh. And, but I, I, I always felt like that was secondary to her role as a mom. And I at one point told her, you know, when I'm older, I want to write music and make movies and, and be in entertainment and, and write books in my spare time like you, you know. <laughs> I always viewed it as her spare time, you know. She always, and I think God gave her a grace to be a mom first. I never felt like... Um, we took the, the back seat. Um, and I just was always, I always wanted to run ideas by her. Hey, I wrote this, you know, silly short story and she would read it and give me feedback or, you know, I made movies with friends where I would write the credits on paper and, you know, roll them over the video camera <laughs> so you could see. And she was always supportive. And I think she got that from my, my grandpa who I, I call Papa. 
but her her dad, you know, raised her saying, "Someone has to be the next best selling author. It might as well be you." You know, mm. and and stay humble and trust that if God wants to make it happen, you know, it'll happen. And so I think just that belief in in me and my siblings' dreams as well. It was always championed, you know. So I always viewed her life as very unique and all these amazing, like how many, I didn't have any friends whose mom could write a, a full book in five days, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I remember <laughs> when I was in high school, she wrote a book and it was in a whole book in five days. And I just, I went to school. I was like, my mom wrote, finished a book yesterday. It took her five days to do it. Um, <laughs> but it's just an amazing testament of when someone's really walking in their calling and who God made them to be. That's and true. so it was like, man, I want to do stuff like that too. And. It's such, it's such a unique and special privilege to be in a place to see that example. And that's, I think that's a beautiful thing about believing in the people around us and saying, you can do it. You know, if God has equipped you, you can make it happen. Um, and also just going for it. You know, like this film, she, she talks about how we had to swing the bat. You know, we had this one moment where it's like, if we're going to do it, this is when we're going to do it. And so you, you, you don't step forward knowing how it will look. Um, and her whole life, I've seen her do things like that, where she steps out of the boat and she's not sure where it's going to take her, but she knows she has to be obedient. And that's just continued to inspire me as I keep doing the things that I'm doing in my career too. And when did you realize he was uh, <laughs> unique? unique. <laughs> okay. So Tyler, it was, you know, where two or more are gathered, there the Lord is also. But with Tyler, in addition to that, it was where two or more are gathered, a, a, some sort of a movie or play must happen. <laughs> and he would rope everyone in, young, old. He'd have, you know, the two-year-old cousins and the eight-year-old cousins. And he'd be five. Like, I think he was five when I went, this is going to be something very unique with this. I have a picture front porch of my parents house tyler is directing this play to the older cousins are eight and ten and he's looking up and he's he's mm-hmm. like pointing where they need to go and he's he has it absolutely figured out in his mind and they would they would work on it for half a day and then the parents would get our in you know, a little paper tickets that he would print he, he did the whole thing he had you know props and a direction as to where people would stand and what lines they would say he would be the one whispering lines when the four-year-olds forgot <laughs> what to say but literally he was five years old and he was directing and i said to my husband he's gonna be a director like he sees story so fully and even now like when we write scripts i know he's the one that sees it i hear it i know how dialogue should sound i know what i I know the cadence but he sees it and so as a writing team both of those are critical to the process if you're going to see you know a, a hit movie on the screen and so I, I knew it from the beginning he won some awards as a as an author you know in in writing short stories when he was in middle school and and as he continued you know he played sports he did all the always though the idea of making movies telling stories writing music that was always there and one of his songs is actually in the movie mm-hmm. a song called go there and it's which, perfect which i was like i don't think we should put my song in the movie. yeah he, you know? he didn't want to i said it's a perfect she's like, song we have to put it in and it yeah. does it works really well there really so. was no other song for it he's he's so humble that that's what he mainly had to pray about when it came to being the director it was like this is you know you're taking a giant step of faith yourself that way because there's a lot riding on it. But to us, I mean, you know, money is a tool that God gives you. And if he's leading you, like we, we even talked about, like what if a COVID, you know, outbreak happens and we have to shut down for a week? We could lose actors. We could lose the whole thing. Mm-hmm. That could happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of things could have gone wrong, but they didn't. And we trusted God and we walked forward. He gave us the perfect weather for each shot. Like mm-hmm. how about the cemetery? Oh, yeah. And yeah. we had sunshine for every day, like all the jet skis, everything. And then got to the cemetery and we didn't have the money to water everything down and make it look kind of sad it rained right up until you yelled action, action. yeah it, it rained right up until then so it, it was stopped. gloomy and i mean it's that beautiful kind of gloom you want at a, yeah. a funeral in a movie you know it's just like mm. and we had all those we can't talk about the movie without talking about the miracles that god did and how it was like all right here we go like <laughs> what a great opportunity to tell of his goodness and faithfulness you know well, I wish you two much success with this, and uh, I'm, um, I, I know that you're going to be able to, uh, to uh, not lose the farm. I know. And, uh, and everybody's going to come out and see this. Right. Yes. And it uh, hits theaters when? 
It's in theaters. It opens in theaters on April 2nd. April 2nd. And, you know, this is something you said about, you know, not losing the farm. God has given us signs along the way Mm -hmm. that this is going to be a huge movie. So we released the trailer, and within the first six to eight weeks, we had 10 million-plus views Mm -hmm. on three different posts between TikTok, Facebook, and YouTube. Mm -hmm. And that was unheard of. Like, that was Mm -hmm. just like, what is even happening? You know, and big outlets contacting us, and then... Big press, um, you know, organization saying that someone like you is one of the most anticipated movies of 2024. Like, you can't make this. That's just like the Lord only could do that. Uh, and they're not saying Christian film; they're saying film mm-hmm. in general. Mm-hmm. I also think people are ready for a movie that is um, beautifully clean and deeply challenging all at the same time. So it's deep. It has these, you know, tough issues, and and it's got a lot of graphic, emotional content. But it's you know, you can take whoever you want. You don't have to worry about being embarrassed mm-hmm. when you bring them to the movies. And that's we're ready for that. And they did a big study recently. I think it was at Duke University, and these students who weren't necessarily believers, they said, "We are sick of the smut. We're sick of it. Give mm-hmm. us something that's a real story." So, anyway, I, I think it's going to resonate. I think that what we saw on TikTok is going to happen in the theaters, mm-hmm. and it'll be uh, it'll be exciting. April second. Well, thank you both for stopping by the homestead. Thank you for having us. It's been so fun. (laughs) Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Tyler. The movie is called Someone Like You. It hits theaters on April the 2nd. Uh, Be sure to see it uh, at the beginning of the run because you're going to want to tell your friends to go see it and they're going to want to tell their friends to go see it. This is a real experience. It's so beautifully done. Do take your box of Kleenex because you're going to need it guaranteed. Uh, This is a beautiful story, beautiful love story, and how timely. And just it's just a remarkable God's timing on this. So uh, uh, someone like you, it's theaters April 2nd. Do go see it. And of course, you can check out more about the movie at keepthefaith.com, where we've got all kinds of goodies for you. And you can even get uh, tickets in advance. Uh, We'll give you a link right there at keepthefaith.com where you can get your tickets so you can get really good seats. So check out keepthefaith.com. And for all of our goodies on uh, uh, you know all of our episodes for Contagious Influencers, uh, do to go to uh, contagiousinfluencers.com. I think we're up to 230 or 40 or 50 episodes now. I've lost count. But do check out contagiousinfluencers.com. And this week, I'd love to, uh, love to encourage you to go out there and live that life in living color because it sure is a heck of a lot more interesting than living in black and white. See you next time.